passage, I'll read from it. Um, Assuming the positive supersession of private property, man produces man, himself and other men. On this reading, Marx's notion of communism in the early manuscripts is far from humanism, that is, far from any recourse to a pre-existing or eternal human essence. Instead, the positive content of communism, which co corresponds to the abolition of private property, is the autonomous human production of subjectivity, the human production of humanity, a new seeing, a new hearing, a new thinking, a new loving. This thing brings me back to the analysis of the biopolitical turn of the economy. Um, and that, that's what I think I was talking about before, what I'm calling here the biopolitical turn of the economy, uh, what I was calling before the predominance or hegemony of this immaterial or biopolitical production within the economy and society as a whole. In the context of industrial production, Marx arrived at the important recognition that capitalist production is aimed at creating not only objects but subjects. This is a sentence from the introduction to the Grundrisse that seemed quite useful for me, but I think what I'm talking about now goes beyond it. What he wrote then in the, in, the, in the introduction to the Grundrisse, he said, production thus not only creates an object for the subject, but also a subject for the object. In other words, it not only creates commodities for the subjects, producers and not, but it also creates the subjects for those objects. It produces the worker itself. In the context of biopolitical production, however, the production of subjectivity is much more direct and intense. Some contemporary economists, in fact, analyze the transformations of capital in terms that echo Marx's formulation in the early manuscripts. Let me give you a few examples of this. Uh, the first is from, um, from Boyer, the what do we call regulation school economist in France. And he writes, this is published uh, three or four years ago. He writes, if we had to hazard a guess on the emerging model in the next decades, we would probably have to refer to the production of man by man. I don't think he uses the strange, same strangely gendered formulation that Marx does, the production of man by man. I'm not sure that he's referring to Marx's manuscript, even though it's the same phrase. Uh, Christian Marazzi, the same Italian Swiss economist I was referring to earlier, he similarly understands the current passage in capitalist production as moving toward what he calls an anthropogenetic model. Anthropogenetic, so the production of humanity as being central to the economy. Living beings as fixed capital, he says, are at the center of this transformation and the production of forms of life is becoming the basis of added value. This is a process in which putting to work human faculties, competences, knowledges, and affects, those acquired on the job, but more importantly those accumulated outside work, are directly productive of value. One distinctive feature of the work of head and heart, as it was called several years ago, then is that paradoxically the object of production is really a subject, defined, for example, by a social relationship or a form of life. This should be clear at least the rationale for calling this form of production biopolitical, since what are produced are forms of life. That's what I mean by calling this biopolitical production, production aimed at the, form, at, at the production of forms of life. At least that gives you the bios part. I could try to explain the political part later, but that's not part of this passage, I guess. If I return to Marx in this new light, one can find that the progression of definitions of capital in Marx's work, throughout his work, actually gives an important clue for analyzing this biopolitical context. Although wealth in capitalist society first appears as an immense collection of commodities, that's the first sentence of Capital Volume 1, that the wealth in capitalist society appears as an immense accumulation of commodities, Marx goes on to reveal that capital is really a process of the creation of surplus value via the production of commodities. But Marx develops this insight one step further to discover that in its essence, capital is a social relation. Or, to extend this even further, the ultimate object of capitalist production is not commodities, but social relations relations or forms of life. From the standpoint of biopolitical production, we can even look back and see that the entire, all of capitalist production this way, for instance, the production of the refrigerator and the automobile are only midpoints for the creation of the labor and gender relations of the nuclear family around the refrigerator and the mass product society of individuals isolated together in their cars on the freeway. In other words, that what's the, what's the, what's the real object of capitalist production are these social relations or forms of life, and commodities are merely uh, midpoints in the arrival of them. I've highlighted the correspondence or proximity between Marx's definition of communism and the contemporary biopolitical turn of the capitalist economy, both of which are oriented towards the human production of humanity, social relations and, and forms of life, all in the context of the common. At this point, I need to explain how I regard this proximity and why it's important. But before doing that, let me add one more 
element to the mix, one, one, one more detour or, or parenthesis. And it's about uh, a, a section in uh, an, a, an extended interview with Michel Foucault. It was published in English, I believe, as uh, Remarks on Marx. Uh, and the section I'm in, in question is one after the interview was asked him about the Frankfurt School. And he says, what's the relationship between your work and the Frankfurt School? It seems like there are a lot of commonalities. Um, but what, uh, in, this, in his response, Foucault, it seems to me, appreciates all the strangeness and richness of this line of Marx's thinking that leads to the conclusion that uh, l'homme produit l'homme, that he uses Marx's same gendered formulation of, of man produces man. So first, Foucault cautions that we shouldn't understand Marx's phrase, man produces man, as an expression of humanism. For me, Foucault says, what must be produced is not man as nature designed it, or as its essence prescribes. We must produce something that does not yet exist and we cannot know what it'll be. Foucault also wants not to understand this merely as a continuation of economic production as conventionally conceived. Here's what he says. He says, I don't agree with those who would understand this production of man by man as being accomplished like the production of value, the production of wealth, or of an object of economic use. It is, on the contrary, destruction of what we are and creation of something completely other, a total innovation. We can't understand this production, in other words, in terms of the producing subject and the produced object. Instead, producer and product are both subjects. Humans produce and humans are produced. Foucault clearly senses, it seems to me, without uh, fully understanding it, at least in my view, the explosiveness of this situation. The biopolitical process is not limited to the reproduction of capital as a social relation. It's not only limited to that. It also represents the potential for an autonomous process that could destroy capital and create something entirely new. Biopolitical production obviously implies new mechanisms of exploitation and capitalist control, as I said, but we should also recognize, I think following Foucault's intuition here, how biopolitical production, particularly in ways it exceeds the bounds of capitalist relations and constantly refers to the common, grants labor increasing autonomy and provides the tools or weapons that could be wielded in a project of liberation. Now I'm in a position to understand the point of recognizing the proximity between the idea of communism, as Marx proposed it, and contemporary capitalist production. It's not that capitalist development is creating communism or that biopolitical production immediately or directly brings liberation. Instead, through the increasing centrality of the common in capitalist production, the production of ideas, affects, social relations, and forms of life, are emerging the conditions and weapons for a communist project. Capital, in other words, is creating its own grave diggers. So I've attempted to pursue two primary points. Here I give you a brief review to stop. The first point is really a plea for the critique of political economy, or rather, a claim that any communist project must begin there. Such an analysis makes good on our periodizations and reveals the novelties of our present moment by conducting an investigation of not only the composition of capital, but also class composition, asking, in other words, how people produce, what they produce, and under what conditions, both in and outside the workplace, both in and outside the relations of wage labor. And all this reveals, I maintain, this was my point, the increased centrality of the common. The second point extends the critique of political economy to the critique of property as such. And specifically, communism is defined by not only the abolition of property, but also the affirmation of the common, the affirmation of open and autonomous biopolitical production, the self-governed continuous creation of a new humanity. It's at this point the affirmation of the common is really, it seems to me, a mandate to organize our lives outside of property relations, even our personal lives, even our, even our love lives. Our, 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 our production of love, something like that. Um, and it's this point that I think, or I keep coming back to that Marx's claim that private property has made us stupid. Like what, what would it mean to organize a, a social life outside of property relations? In the most synthetic terms, what private property is to capitalism and what state property is to socialism, the common is to communism. So to put the two points together, now really to finish, uh, the one point that capitalist production increasingly relies on the common, and the second that the autonomy of the common is the, the essence of communism, the two points together I mean to indicate that the conditions and weapons of a communist project are available today more than ever. The task now would be then to organize that.
that's where I stop. Thanks very much. Just tell me which airline do you fly? I'm, I had a hard time to find any caring uh, flight attendants in the last three years. So, <laughs> believe the Thai Airways, they are only, it's only uh -huh. advertising. But they are very busy and then they are disappeared in their own quarters, you know, their own property. Yeah. Okay, but. Um, for the new people, I told you already, this the first minutes after each talk are mine. That is my payment for this ruining my life by founding this place here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm about to know about that. And because it reminds me at the end, you know, we, we are quite near again. And from the Heideggerian uh, tradition, this from Ereignis, they translated in English, an omen. Mm -hmm. Taking away the idea of property. Mm -hmm. And also, what we Ereignis see, what is appropriation and deappropriation. Yeah. Appropriation coming into your own only if you are able to leave it. To